to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the psalmist said zeal for your house has eaten me up and while those words in psalm 69 verse 9 are no doubt applied to jesus as he cleansed the temple it would also apply in practicality to one great man in the Old Testament who was fed up with sin and who took righteous action. His name is Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron and high priest, will ultimately be high priest to God. We welcome you today to our study of great Bible characters. The scripture records in Romans 15 verse 4, the things that were written before time were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might find hope of the lessons in the Old Testament that can encourage, that can instruct, that can give us hope and comfort. Many of those can be found in the lives of godly men and women who stand as examples. As always, today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Lord's Church in your area would love to get to know you better. They'd love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Uh, if you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about God's Church and His truth, they'd love to sit down in any way and help you with that. At the Gospel of Christ, we're also concerned about souls. That's our whole motto and our whole mission, taking the whole gospel to the whole world. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, please visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. You can find a host of Bible study materials that are all free for you to watch. And also, if you'd like to have a copy of your own, you can visit our media request page and there you can download or request a DVD or a CD. And if you've got a Bible question or anything that you may be thinking about spiritually, please email us and let us know those. We'd love to hear from you as we always love to hear from our viewers. As we think today about the righteousness and the zeal of Phinehas, let's take just a moment to get a little background on who this Phinehas is. In Exodus chapter 6 verse 25, we note that he is the grandson of Aaron who was Moses' spokesperson and high priest of God. The Bible records that he was one of the chief officers of the Korahites, of the Korahites who also were of the priestly order of the tribe of Levi. Later, he became high priest after Eleazar died, and, and Phinehas is most remembered, is greatest, greatest remembered for. There was a plague going on in Israel, and his zeal in killing an ungodly man and woman committing adultery is what stopped that plague. Number, numbers chapter 25, verse number 8. In fact, this was such a righteous action, uh, such a very important action, that this action is actually commemorated. In Psalm 106, verses 28 through 30, this service that he performed to God in fulfilling that righteous act secured the succession of the priesthood to his house for future generations. Numbers chapter 25, verses 11 through 13. And so let's take just a moment. It's a short text, and I want us to take just a moment and let's notice the context of Numbers 25, beginning in verse number 1. The scripture records... Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord, out in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Every one of you, 
kill his men who were joined to Baal of Peor. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses, in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the high priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation, took a javelin in his hand, he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust the both of them through, the man of Israel, and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel, and those who died in the plague were 24,000. You know, when you think about this very important and dramatic event that is going on here, the background is that God had commanded His people. When they came out of the Exodus wanderings, when they became that chosen special, pe special people, God clearly commanded them, I don't want you to marry, I don't want you to have the interaction with, don't take them as your friends, you don't have anything to do with these heathen, idolatrous, ungodly nations. Well, in spite of that command, Israel had become intermingled with the people of Baal of Peor, even to the point that they had taken some of the heathens as their wives and were actually, they're up on the mountaintop. There they are with their wives. They're up on the mountaintop. They're, they're actually worshiping and involved in this horrible idolatrous action. And so this was clearly done in a direct violation of God's commands and rebellion to His will. Now, as a result of this, there was a very serious and stiff penalty. God told Moses, I want you to gather all the leaders. I want you to gather all the officers. I want you to hang them in the sunlight for all Israel to see as an example. And while the people are taking care of this, there's one man who is so brazen, uh, so, uh, show, show, has so much showmanship in what he's doing, that not only is he out there worshiping and committing this harlotry and adultery, he has the brazenness to bring this woman there in front of Moses in the camp and take her into his tent. And so he's just doing it out in front of everybody. No respect for God or His will in doing this. Now, this is where Phinehas enters the scene. There is a, a, a death going on. A death of 24,000 occurs. What stopped this horrible plague that was going on? When Phinehas, a righteous man of God, knew that Zimri had taken this woman into his tent to commit lewdness and idolatry with her, he grabbed a spear we might think of, went into the man's tent, drove it through him and her together. And friend, it was this righteous act. His zeal for God and his house was to the top. He couldn't take it anymore. And so it was this righteous act that stopped that plague. In fact, in Psalm 106 verse 31, it is said of God, and that it was accounted to him for righteousness to all generations forevermore. And because of what he did, God honored him and his house with having the priesthood among them forever. Are we, is the idea here that men and women are to take up swords and spears today? That's not the idea. But here's a man who was serious about God. Here's a man who was serious about sin, about righteousness, and about keeping the camp and the house of God, and no doubt that tabernacle with him pure, and he, he saw God as holy and righteous as he should be. And he went to extreme lengths in making sure this man's sin was dealt with in an according manner. Now, as you think about Phinehas, and as we say to ourselves, okay, great story, great lesson, great man of courage, righteousness, and zeal. How does this apply to us today? Well, let's make practical application from the life of Phinehas for ourselves in the church and the kingdom of the Lord today. What do these lessons teach us? Friend, we first learn a very practical lesson from God's dealings with Israel in this context. And is this, God expects His people to obey Him. God had clearly told them as they left Exodus, as they entered the Canaan land, God had clearly told them, don't mingle with these people. Don't marry them. Don't take their wives. Don't have children with them. They're going to be a thorn in your flesh. Don't have anything to do with them. They didn't listen, and it was a thorn in their flesh. Friend, God expected His people to obey Him. Now, 
as we make practical application from that lesson, let's realize just very practically, very simply, as God's people today, He expects us to obey Him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. Jesus clearly said in Matthew 7, when some were saying, you know, have we, done, have we not done this in your name and this in your name and done many good works in your name? Jesus said, some of you I'm going to say I didn't know you. Why? It's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus said to the, to the pious Pharisees and scribes who, who would take themselves and say, yes, we're the religious elite. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't even do the things which I say? You can't call Christ Lord, the point is, if you're not willing to follow and obey Him. Revelation chapter 22, verses 11 through 14, clearly teaches us that blessed are those who keep His commandments. Yes, we must obey God. We absolutely must keep His commandments. Are we then going to look up to heaven and beat our breast and say, I've earned salvation? No, we're still saved by the grace of God. Don't get me wrong, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. But don't miss this either. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Friend, when the Bible tells us, gives us command. For example, when the Bible says we're to worship God in spirit and in truth, I can't avoid that command to be right with God. I can't look the other way. I've got to worship God with all my heart and soul, mind and strength. And then I also must worship God according to truth, which is this book, John 17, 17. I, I've got to worship in the manner that God tells me to. I don't want to add to or take away things that aren't in the Bible. And so I must do exactly what God teaches as it relates to things like the plan of salvation. This is such a, a practical lesson. Think about this. When Christ tells me and tells you, commands us to do something to be saved, can I fail to do that and still be saved? For example, Jesus said in John 8, 24, Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. If I say, I'm not going to believe in Jesus, but I want to go to heaven. Is that going to work? Of course not. When Jesus says, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Can I keep living in sin and not repent and think I'm going to go to heaven? Well, no, I can't do that. What about when Jesus says to be baptized? For the remission of sins, and people don't do that. He that believes and is baptized will be saved, Mark 16, 16. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And people say, well, I might have been baptized, but it wasn't for the remission of sins. Wait a minute now. If Jesus commanded that, I don't keep that command, can I be right with God? A second very practical lesson that we learn is this. God has always wanted His people to be separated from the world and from sinners. God wants us to draw a line. He wants us to not become intermingled with, to remain on the righteous side, to try to do right. Does that mean we're not going to try to reach the world, live in the world? No, that's not the idea. But I don't want to take on their values, their morals, their gods, and their way of life. Rather, we want to be God's own special people. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 17 and 18. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, I will be to you a God, you shall be my people. That's the mentality of Christians. I want to come out of the world. I want to be separated to God. I don't want to live like, think like, and act like the world. Now, why is it we've got to come out of the world? Here's why. All that is in the world, lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, it's not of the Father, but of the evil one, and the world and the lust of it. It's one day going to perish. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. Why is it that we as Christians need to be separated from the world? Here's why. The Bible says in James 4, verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world makes himself God's enemy. You cannot serve God and worldly riches. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 24. And then think about this. If I become unequally yoked together with unbelievers, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 and 15. What kind of problem does that present? Well, you think about it as it were maybe a, a man's working in the field and he's got a plow hooked up to two mules and one of those mules is really good and one of them's really not very good. 
what's going to happen to the good boy? He's going to do all the pulling. He's going to do all the work. He's going to drag the other one part of the way. What if a Christian is intermingled with a non-Christian? He's going to end up doing a lot of that. He's going to end up having to pull that person. It's not going to be a very good yoke. It's going to be very, very unequal. And so the principle is your morals are not their morals. Your way of life is not their way of life. Your God is often not their God. Why would you want to join yourself to someone who doesn't have the same values that God and Christ want us to have? Thirdly, as we think about practical lessons, here's a very valuable. Friend, in the Bible, God always means what He says. Now, we ought not to think that to be hard, but sometimes it is hard for people to understand. When God told the people, I don't want you to intermingle, did He really mean it? When God told the people, I don't want you to go up on the mountaintop and worship their gods. When God told the people, I don't want you involved in this idolatry and adultery, did God really mean what He said? There on the horizon lying the hanged bodies, sitting out in the sun of all those offenders. Did God really mean it? Friend, you bet He did. Their bodies littered the camp. People looked up at the sun and they saw the corpses hanging. God always means what He says. Another couple of examples we might give you. Uh, think for yourself about Nadab and Abihu. They offered a sacrifice that was unauthorized to God, but God had not commanded it. Leviticus 10 verses 1 and 2, and fire rained down from heaven. And they died in the presence of the Lord. Did God really mean it when He said, only do what I say? Absolutely. Think about in the New Testament, Nadab and Abihu, they, or excuse me, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, they, they lie to the Holy Spirit. They try to keep back some of the money of themselves. They both dropped dead on the spot because God really means what He says. When, when God teaches us from the Scripture what He wants, I need to take Him at His word. When God says sin is sin and that it will separate us from Him, friend, I need to believe that. When God says the wages of sin is death, I need to realize if I get caught up in sin, I'm going to face those consequences. When God tells us not to cheat or to lie or to steal or whatever practical application we might make, God means what He says and there'll be blessing if we do what He says and there'll be consequences if we don't do what our God says. Which leads us to our next point. As always, when we don't obey God, there will always be harsh consequences, hard consequences default. Is that because God's a mean and angry God? No. But friend, God tells us the best way to live. John 10 verse 10, Jesus said, I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. If I follow Christ, stay on the right path and do His will, I've got the best life possible. What if I get off that path? I've chosen to live the life that's not the best. And friend, there will be harsh consequences to that. Uh, of some of the people who were in the rebellion of Korah. You remember the rebellion of Korah? In the Old Testament, they thought Moses had too much authority. They said, give us a little authority too. We're also Levites in essence. We ought to have some priestly authority. They rebelled against Moses. They rebelled against God. And the ground opened up and swallowed people into it. Were there stiff consequences when they rebelled against God? You bet. What about today? Friend, there are more serious consequences today than there ever was in the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 ask the question, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? There was a, a penalty under the old law and yet we face a stiffer penalty today, not in the sense that God is going to open up the ground and we're going to be swallowed in it, but friend, if people live in sin, Listen carefully, God doesn't want this to happen. We don't want this to happen. If people live in sin and die in sin and they're in sin at the judgment of God, the blood of Christ is not applied to their spirit. They have not walked in the light. Friend, there is a place called hell. There is a place of eternal torment. God wants all men to be saved. We want all men to be saved. But rest assured, there is a majority of people, be sure there are a majority of people who are going down that wrong path that leads to destruction. And so I need to know there are consequences to my actions and I must be aware of that. Then as a practical lesson, 
we mention this. You know, as God's children, we need to stand up for what's right and stand up and oppose those living in sin and trying to please God at the same time. You know, the very idea of trying to stand up for what's right is something that we all ought to believe in. Just, just imagine if you saw some travesty. Let's say you're walking down the street and there is somebody who steals an old lady's purse. Grabs her purse and just starts really having his way with her and is going to try to take all her money. Would you stand up for that? If, if at all possible, would you stand up for her and what's right? Well, sure you would. That's a travesty. That's something people ought to stand up for. Somebody taking advantage of that. Well, what about when it comes to God's truth and souls and things that are eternally important? Christians ought to stand up for what's right, stand up and oppose those who are living in sin and do something about it. And by that I mean this. We've got to contend earnestly for the faith. Are we fighting today? You bet we are. What kind of fight? the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, verses 11 through 18. We're battling against the foes of darkness, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. We're taking the Word of God as our guide, as our sword, and we're doing battle against ungodliness and sin. How am I to do that? I'm to speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4 verse 15, I'm to reach out the best way possible to those who may be opposing what's right, to those who may be living in sin. 1 Corinthians 5, among the people of God, if there are those living in sin, there is an action just as zealous and just as righteous as what Phinehas did. And you see it in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul said, disfellowship that ungodly man. Put him out of your assembly. Don't have anything to do with him. Don't associate with him. Don't even eat with him is the idea. I'm not going to treat him as an enemy, but I'm going to admonish him as a brother, but at the same time, you've got to draw a line and make sure that we don't allow sin to continue for the saving of people's souls. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 4 and 5. Another very practical lesson is we need the zeal and the courage to stand up and speak out about morality. Friend, as we think about having zeal, having courage, speaking out about things that are morally wrong. You've got a heinous situation going on here. A man living in brazen sin and rebellion to God. God said, don't marry him. He says, God, not only am I going to marry him, I'm going to take her in my tent right here in front of everybody, and I don't care what you say. How brazen was he? And yet, we need the courage, just as Phinehas had, to stand up and speak out about morality. Let me mention a few things as it relates to the subject of marriage. Friend, we need the courage to stand up and say what God says. One man, one woman for life, the only reason for divorce is fornication, and then it's not a must. Genesis 2 verse 24, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. How the world needs to hear God's principles of morality there. And then, as Jesus said in Matthew 19, 9, the only scriptural reason for divorce is except for fornication, sexual immorality, and then and only then does the innocent party have the right, according to Jesus, to remarry. We need to stand up and speak out about morality as it relates to things that especially are relevant to us today, whether it be gambling, which is a horrible uh, tax on the poor, whether it be moral issues like abortion where uh, even Planned Parenthood these days is seen on video are doing these heinous and ungodly things. Where are Christians when those videos are seen, when the evidence is there, when we're selling out baby parts after, where's the outcry? Where's the zeal? Stand up for morality on times like those. But friend, we also must take action against those who are ungodly. Now, by action again, please don't misunderstand our words. Are we saying we're going to take up a javelin and go look into state? No, it's not the idea. Of course not. We want to fight with the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 6, 17. We want to, in love, speak the truth. Does that mean it might make it uncomfortable for some? Sure. Is it ever comfortable to have sin pointed out and people turn to the Bible and say, we're encouraging you to stop living like this? Never comfortable. But listen carefully, it's the right thing to do. And friend, in a world where, listen carefully, in the United States of America, 
we are still a Christian majority. As a Christian majority who believes in the Bible, when will we rise up and with one voice say what God has said? Put a stop to some of this immorality and ungodliness by, by people who believe in the Bible uniting together and letting God's voice in this one nation under God be heard. And then finally, we mention this. As we think about courage, as we think about righteousness, as we think about zeal, friends, zeal in doing the right thing is to be commended, not looked down on. I wonder what some of the people in Phinehas' day thought. Can you imagine the cries that went out when that happened? Can you imagine the looks on people's face? Some people are like, oh, he shouldn't have done that. He did the right thing at that time. He was commended by God. And friend, when people stand up and speak the truth, even if that's uncomfortable, even if it's unpopular, we need to encourage to hold up their hands and to do everything we can to support that in the desperate times. They lived in then and we now live in today. As we think about Phinehas, as we think about his righteousness, as we think about his zeal, as we think about his life, he stands as an example of a man who went to great lengths to make sure that God, His truth, His kingdom, and He came first in the choices Israel made. He had to make a hard decision, but it was the right decision. Friend, have you made the decision yourself to follow God? If you've never become a Christian, you can make the decision today to be filled with God's righteousness, to have the zeal to do right by obeying Christ. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Have you heard the word? Do you really believe Jesus is the Christ? Would you turn from sin and turn to the Lord? Would you make that great confession? Acts chapter 8, verses 37 through 39. And would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Here's what Jesus said. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. If you've never become a Christian, never obeyed the gospel, have the courage and the zeal today to regardless of the cost, obey Christ and live with fervor for Him every day. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is taking the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.